Welcome, everyone, and thanks for being here for uh, what promises to be a really exciting conference on the foundations of quantum field theory. So uh, Wayne and I were reflecting on the fact that it was already a decade ago that we had a quantum field theory workshop here at Western, which some of you participated in. And that was a really great event, and we uh, had the feeling at that point of opening up a, a number of new topics and philosophical discussions of quantum field theory. And it's been astonishing to us how much new work has been done in this area. And so it was high time for us to revisit this theme and bring in a number of the younger scholars who've been contributing in this area, as, long as, as well as uh, some of the contributors to the original conference invited back. And also, we're happy to have uh, an interdisciplinary conference this year with a number of physicists contributing. So, um, so this is a very exciting event. I'm going to have just a few sort of programmatic announcements, and then I'm going to turn things over to Mike Miller, who's going to be chairing the session this morning. Um, in terms of organizational notes, uh, a few things to mention about the space we're in. One is that we do request that you try to keep food in that part of the room. So uh, I realize I didn't announce this before, so obviously don't worry about it at the moment, but uh, uh, please keep the food in that area. And lunch will be served in that area, but I'd also like to encourage you to consider going outside. There's benches down on the ground floor. It's a beautiful day, so you can enjoy it. But please, for lunches and other uh, uh, snacks, keep them in that part of the room. Um, Another thing to mention is uh, regarding dinners. So we have a somewhat restricted budget for the conference this year, so we haven't been able to extend the invitation to dinners to everyone. We're uh, inviting uh, our invited speakers and several of our out-of-town guests. If you feel that you uh, should have been invited to dinners, some of you should have, most of you should have gotten emails about this. If you would like to attend dinner and weren't uh, invited, please uh, let me know. There is perhaps space, but we do have to be more restricted just because we don't have a, a full budget to cover everyone for dinners. For lunch, everyone here should be able to, uh, to have lunch on us. So, uh, so again, it, just with regards to dinners, let us know if, if you'd like to attend and we'll let you know if there's uh, space available. Um, and in terms of any other organizational arrangements, uh, Deborah Fox, who's at the back of the room at the moment, has been taking care of things for us. So let me take an opportunity now to thank Deborah and the team of graduate students from LMP who've done all the organizational work to get this conference going. So thank you, Deborah. <laughs> and now, without further ado, let me turn it over to Mike Miller, who will chair the sessions today. Great. So thanks, Chris. Um, is it okay without the microphone? Is that good? Um, Great, so today we'll have three talks, um, the first of which will be from Wayne Mirbel, one of the uh, organizers of the conference, and he's going to be talking about collapse theories for relativistic QFT problems and prospects. Take away, Wayne. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Chris, for really getting this whole thing going. Um, yeah, so, all right, I'm, this is what I'm going to be talking about. I don't need to stand near the mic, do you? Do I? You can hear me. Good, okay. All right, okay, so um, recently, um, some of the discussion around um, scientific realism has, and I think this is a very good thing, started to shift towards questions of interpreting quantum field theories. In particular, interpreting quantum field theories knowing full well they're not fundamental theories but are effective th of theories. Um, and that raises the question of, well, what does it mean to be a realist about quantum theory in the first place? Sometimes when I talk to, um, sometimes when you talk to physicists about the very existence of a um, literature on philosophy of quantum theory, you get the impression that they think that, well, the reason people are talking about things is people just can't accept the counterintuitive aspects of quantum theory, and you should just accept the world as quantum. Okay, I accept that the world is quantum. Um, but what does that mean? What does that, te what am I saying about the world? In particular, can I take, look at a quantum theory and understand it as a theory about a world that includes things like tables and chairs and 
trees and things like that. And this is not a new issue. This is an issue that goes back to the very early days of quantum theory. So quantum field theory brings it uh, with a new conceptual issues that you don't find in quantum mechanics, some of them having to do with relativity and some of them having to do with the related issue of having infinitely many degrees of freedom. Um, but the old issues still remain. The, the, the interpretational issues associated with quantum mechanics don't vanish when you go to a, a quantum field theory thing. In particular, sorry, sorry. Um, if I want to be a realist about quantum theory, if I want to take it as at least a candidate for a physical theory of the world around us, at least something, or, or at least one that's valid in a certain domain, you know, at certain energy levels, it should include in, within an account of macroscopic objects, tables, chairs, and things. And, okay, let's see, we tr try to represent those within the theory. And this is something that happens, you know, this is often called the measurement problem because it, this is something that happens if you try to represent your measurement apparatus even very schematically within the theory. Of course, Bohr would say that's a mistake. We just assume a classical world and apply quantum mechanics to um, everything else. But if we actually do want to think that quantum mechanics is at least in principle a theory that could encompass things like that, we have to face the fact that no matter how, you know, how what we represent our equipment or macroscopic objects in the theory, so there's going to be certain degrees of freedom associated with those objects that we um, represent by operators. Among the allowed states of the theories are theories that would be superpositions of macroscopically very different states of affairs. So a superposition of this table being here and that table being there. And you might say, okay, fine, if we might be able to just avoid those kinds of states, but if we keep the ordinary linear unitary evolution, you can't. This is often illustrated, it's called the measurement problem because it's often illustrated by a measurement context. If you're doing an experiment and you start out um, with a system that's in a non-trivial superposition of the quantity being measured, I shouldn't use that word, um, then if, you're, if your um, equipment works this, the way it ought to, and if the um, evolution is unitary evolution all the way the um, equipment ends up in the superposition of reading this and reading that. Okay. Okay. Um, now there's a nice classification of approaches to this issue that I like to use, um, which comes from a a remark that Bell made um, at the beginning of his essay, Are There um, Quantum Jumps? Now, he's talking about non-relativistic quantum mechanics, and what he says there is either the wave function, as given by the Schrodinger equation, isn't everything or isn't right. Now, um, Paraphrase slightly so that I'm not bringing in concepts alien to quantum field theory. Either the quantum state is given by un unitary evolution isn't everything or it's not right. And that's what you have to think unless you're going to be some kind of um, many worlds person, which Bell was implicitly excluding from that because he was not a fan of those things. All right. So there's basically, if you look at very, if we think that we ought to be able to get something like a macro, macro world in the theory, there's basically three ways to go. One is say, okay, quantum state is not a complete representation of um, things in the world. So this would be a hit, what's, this would include those approaches that are misleadingly called hidden variables uh, um, theories. Um, Bell in one of his papers remarked that when it comes to something like the Bohm theory, hidden variables is the wrong word because those particle positions that are, are the manifest variables, those are the things we see. Of course, some people deny that a quantum state represents anything in physical reality at all. It's just a state of belief. That's included under this because if it doesn't represent anything, 
then either there isn't anything or it doesn't represent everything. Right. Okay. <laughs> or another approach, and this um, is inspired by the sort of textbook collapse postulate that just says, at an end of experiment, you replace the state by a collapsed state. Uh, something that goes back to von Neumann and Dirac. Um, there are um, attempts to modify the evolution so that you actually get something like that, that you end up not getting into these um, superpositions of macroscopically distinct states. And then you could just deny both horns of the dilemma and say, maintain the quantum states as given by you in evolution is everything and just try to make sense of that. And that gets you into kind of some kind of um, many worlds or variety and kind of interpretations. So this talk is about option two. Um, if you go to a relativistic context, um, the only thing that really has, you know, you know, the only thing developed that's been developed for non-relativistic quantum mechanics that does that goes over to a, a relativistic context without change is num number three. Um, hidden variables theories, there are theorems to the effect that they're going to have to require a distinguished relation of distance simultaneity. So the world might look relativistic, but deep down it's not. So the question I, I, I'm going to ask is, well, could I have a really relativistic dynamical collapse theory. Um, for first, I'm going to say something about collapse theories for non-relativistic quantum mechanics because they're more familiar and simpler. And then I'm going to talk about collapse theories for relativistic quantum field theories, and I'm going to give a fairly general framework for, 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 for such theories. Um, under mild consideration, mild assumptions, a th you know, a theory would have to fit into that kind of framework. And then I'm going to present a theorem that's, that, that says, as, as nice as that framework worked, there actually is nothing that satisfies the conditions. And then the question is, where do we go from here? So the, the, the dialectic of no-go theorems is if they have certain premises, certain conditions you think a theory, you'd like a theory to satisfy and they turned out to be not too mutually satisfiable. So the options are, well, you reject at least one of, of, of the premises. And basically the dialectic of, of these things, these no-go theorems, you know, in a perfect world, someone would say, okay, here are the, the, the conditions I would like my theory to satisfy and show they're impossible. In practice, what happens is someone attempts to construct a theory of a certain sort, and it has some unexpected or apparently undesirable features, and someone sits down and says, well, is that inevitable? Um, can we do without it? That's the genesis of Bell's theorem. Bell was looking at um, hidden variable theories, he knew about the de Broglie-Bohm theory. It had this non-locality in it. He says, is that just an artifact of the um, way the theory is formulated, or is it inherent in the very nature project of making a theory of this type? And so where this um, no-go theorem came from is um, I was um, writing an article on relativistic considerations of quantum mechanics for the forthcoming um, Routledge Companion to Philosophy of Physics, and I started going back and thinking about collapse theories for the first time after, a se after several years. And as a matter of fact, there are working relativistic collapse theories for quantum field theories um, due to Daniel Bettingham and Philip Pearl, but they've got a weird feature. And I'll talk about la later about what that weird feature is. And so I was asking myself, why? Why were these people uh, uh, end up introducing this, this, this weird feature and um, realized that there was a certain inevitability about it given other assumptions? OK. So now I'll talk about prospects you know, in, in light of that, where to go from here. OK. Um, so the 
dynamical collapse theory that the, the first really well formulated one that actually seemed to work was um, um, the theory that the, that the um, authors called um, quantum mechanics with spontaneous localization. So the acronym ought to be QMSL, but um, who listens to authors, right? So um, we call it the GRW theory, a Girardi Rimini Weber theory, and that's the theory that's most familiar, I think, to, philo to philosophers. It's not going to be familiar to everyone. So that's in the in the framework of non-relativistic um, quantum mechanics. You've got a system of n particles. It doesn't matter whether they have spin at all. It, um, it, it works just the same thing. And the evolution of the quantum state is ordinary um, Schrodinger evolution, punctuated by occasional hits, collapses. And what happens when one of those happens is the quantum state, so you've got this n particle state, gets acted upon by um, some operator. And what it from, from a family of operators, so there's an index i there that uh, um, indices which particle it happens to. There's a continuous index y is where it happens. And basically, what this operator li of y does is it multiplies this many particle wave function with some kind of fairly narrow Gaussian, Gaussian in the coordinate of particle y centered at y. And when that happens and where it happens and to which particle it happens is a matter of chance. It's a stochastic process. So um, the, the way that, so the authors have to give, give me a probability rule. Have to, uh, if, if you're going to define a stochastic process, you have to tell me which, you know, not only what the possible evolutions are, but the, their respective probabilities. So every um, particle has a, um, constant probability per unit time of undergoing one of these hits. And the probability function, density function for where it hits is, um, is just given by the squared norm of the new, um, of, of, the, of the new state. That's gonna, not gonna be not normalized, I'm gonna be, writing things like that. So if you like to keep your states normalized, just put a normalization constant under there. It doesn't matter. But, okay. So, um, I'm actually should, I, that should, should be P I. I don't, I don't know why I have an, an N there. And the way it's rigged up is that if you've got one particle just chugging along by itself, um, it's, Going, you can watch it as long as you want. It's going to obey Schrodinger equation because um, um, for any given particle, the, 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 the collapse rate is very low. But if you get a situation where you've got a macroscopic number of, t of particles, say, you know, a pointer position where you've got a superposition, you know, if you ever got to a superposition of a macroscopic number of particles in the superposition of pointing here and pointing here, then if any one of those particles takes a hit, it takes the whole state with, with them. So what it, what it, it tends to suppress is um, superpositions of macroscopic numbers of particles uh, um, in a, a, a distance apart, which is um, large compared to this um, collapse width. Okay. Now, even though um, that's the one, the, the theory that most philosophers are familiar with and um, has been the locus of most of the discussion in the philosophical literature. The authors, GRW themselves, said, okay, um, this is an interesting little toy model, but if you want to get serious, um, there, there's problems with a, a, a particular flaw with it is it doesn't respect symmetrization and anti-symmetrization. Um, requirements of wave functions. If you have a properly symmetrized wave function and a hit happens to one of the particles, you'll get one that's not. Um, so um, next move was to make a move to um, something that um, got called the continuous spontaneous localization particle, par 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 uh, 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 
continue, continue responding to saying it's a localization theory. This was created by um, GRW in collaboration with Philip Pearl. Basically, um, Pearl ended up taking a sabbatical and working with Girardi in his group, and that's where it came, um, came from. Um, there's various versions of it because the, what, what you have is basically a schema where you can put put in collapse to near eigenstates of any set of commuting observables you want. But the one that seems to make most physical sense is um, one that smears to a that collapse to near eigenstates of a smear dense mass density diversion. So working in a Fox based re 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 representation, suppose you've got still re non relativistic, but you know, imagine you've got a non relativistic quantum field theory in Galilean space time. So you've got certain particle types in the indices indexed by K. Do I have a where's my M? Okay. Anyways, I was trying to get a, a, a glowing dot. Anyways, so uh, you've got um, particle types indexed by 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 um, uh, uh, um, in index K. You've got creation and annihilation operators for 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 um, for those. You you define these smeared number density operators where um, G is some kind of fairly narrowly narrowly peaked, but not you know, narrowly peaked by macroscopic uh, um, uh, um, on, on a macroscopic scale, but not so narrowly peaked that you're adding absurd numbers of amount of energy to the the system when you when you go to near eigenstates of this. And smeared mass density is just sum over that um, weighted by the masses they expect possible. And then what they do is they write down a stochastic differential equation, which has the effect that it will, given initial states, will tend to put the state in a near eigenstate of these smeared mass densities. I'm not going to um, write down the equation because if you're not familiar with it, um, it's just looking at it for five seconds isn't going to, going, going to help. So, but what, so, it, what, so it, it, it tends to lead to approximate eigenstates of this, which means that if I look at any region of the, so the sort of stable states of this theory, have the, if I look at any region of space which is large compared to this smearing width, smearing volume, it will be close, always be close to an eigenstate of, of, of amount of mass there. And if you think about it, that kind of picture gives you at least um, a sense of a picture of a macroscopic world. So if I tell you what you know, if I if I if I were to tell you nothing about the room but the pattern of mass density in the room, that would tell you where the tables and chairs are and where the people are. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's 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 all in Galilean space time. Let's make a move to a relativistic space time. One thing that we have to think about is how we're going to formulate this in the first place. So these are all formulated in a, as stochastic modifications of a Schrodinger e e equation. So we're working in the Schrodinger picture. Now, if you've taken a intro quantum field theory uh, um, course, it's all expressed in terms of the Heisenberg picture. So there, you, you know, you've got field operators associated with regions of space, and a state is a state for all those observables, no matter where they are or, 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 or when they are, you know, globally both, it's a globally both spatially and um, temporally. And that sort of picture does not lend us very well, very well to a collapse theory. So people who have formulated these things um, have tended to formulate them in a picture which I call a stochastic Tomonaga-Schwinger picture. If you look back at 
quantum field theory as done in the late 40s and the 50s and even some textbooks in the early 60s. In particular, you'll see this in Sam Schwaber's um, textbook from early 1960 or whatever it is. Um, there, um, okay. There's something called a um, um, Tomana Schwing Tomanaga Schwinger picture. And that's a version of the interaction picture where you've got Heisenberg picture operators of a free field, but then you've got with every space like Cauchy surface, you associate a quantum state and um, the state evolves ac according to what is called the Tomanaga Schwinger equ equ equation, which involves the interaction Hamiltonian. Nice. So here's the picture. Take your quant favorite quantum field theory, free or interacting. Solve the equations of motion, right? Get your Heisenberg picture oper uh, 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 operators associated with regions of with points points of space time. Okay, we're going to um, associate. Uh, with any space like Cauchy surface, a quantum state um, psi, psi of sigma. And then we're gonna need a rule for given a state a, 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 on, on, a, on a given Cauchy surface, evolving it forward. We don't, we don't necessarily have to evolve it backwards, forward evolution. So, um, and if you want that right right sign of the differential equation, you'll, what you're going to want to do is um, write down an equation of um, evolving it through a small region um, that you, know, you take the limit as, as, the, as the region between um, the two hypersurfaces, the size of the region between the two hypersurfaces goes to zero. If you've seen the, uh, the Tomanaga Schwinger equation, it's written in that, type, that form. So suppose I've got two, um, um, hypersurfaces, which are the same everywhere except um, for this bounded region in, in between where sigma prime is to the future of, of sigma. So sigma prime is nowhere to the past of sigma. So I've got a finite region. And here's the picture. Something's going to happen in, this, in, in that, that interval between, be, between those two hypersurfaces. So the theory has to give us a candidate of things that are going to happen and a probably distribution, he says, this is o o o over those things that could happen. So, associated with this region, there's going to be some probability space. Gamma delta is the class of things that ha can happen. F delta is some I sigma algebra of, um, of subsets of this, which are the things I'm going to assign probabilities to. And we have a sort of background measure on that space. That measure is not going to give us our probabilities, but we're going to use it to define the probabilities because clearly the probabilities are going to have to depend on the state. Right? The probability for, psi, for various candidates for psi of sigma prime is going to have to depend on psi of sigma. So the way it's going to work is um, for any gamma in my space of things can, that can happen, I'm, and I'm speaking very schematically here because I want this to be a very general kind of thing. There's going to be a, an operator, and what's going to happen is one of the, so I've got some set of operators, and one of those operators is going to be the one that actually implements the evolution from, one, from sigma to sigma prime. So for some, for, for some gamma, the state on sigma prime will be just the result of operating on this with, um, um, with, with, on, on psi of sigma with that operator. And um, the probability will, and this is, you know, you've seen this something very similar before in the GRW theory, the probability will be just uh, um, uh, of g for gamma being in a certain measurable subset of the space. It's just gonna be the integral of, um, over delta of that. So the probability density with respect to this measure here is just going to be given by, by the square of the, of the norm of the new thing. Now some of you, for, for those of you who are familiar with this language, what we're doing is um, 
you know, each one of those k gammas is a selective completely positive operator. And the if you average all, over all of, of um, I, I, I need to say, yeah. And so probabilities, independently of the state, the probability, the, 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 the total probability has to be one. So yeah, so what we're doing is, for those of you, yeah, this is something more familiar to people who work in um, quantum information theory is, yeah, for each gamma, there is a completely positive operation, which is the one that's going to happen. And then there's also a average over all the possibilities, which would be a non-selective completely positive operation. So that's all, you know, if, I, if you assume that, then you're, then you're, you're, um, in a scheme like this, and there are theorems due to Shazan and collaborators that if you're going to have evolution in a relativistic space, space time, under mild side assumptions, it's going to have to take this form to avoid um, having superluminal signaling. Okay. So, imposing restraints, requirements of relativistic causality on this basic picture. Suppose I've got two hypersurfaces which differ in two bounded regions, um, and I want to go from sigma to sigma prime. Well, you can do it all at once, or you could do it in steps. You could evolve through region delta, or and then delta prime, or do it in reverse order. These are at space-like separation from each other, so um, there's no intrinsic fact about what the order of them is, so I should be able to do it either way, from, yeah, in either order, and get the same results. But what does same results mean? Because it's stochastic theory, and there's no, no such thing as the result that I'm sure to get. When, when, I, when I say it's the same thing either way, what I mean is either process gives you the same set of, given a state on psi of sigma, it gives you the same sets of possible states on sigma and the same probabilities. And um, necessary and convic sufficient condition for that is that the evolution operators, the k gammas associated with those two regions, which are space-like separation from each other, commute with each other. Okay, now suppose I'm, sitting here in a lab about to do an experiment. And so I know someone else at some distance is about to do, to, actually is going to choose to do an experiment or not. I don't know which. And this is a space like separation from me. So if I take you know, a little time slice of, of, the, of, of this room, there'll be a space like hypersurface that goes to, goes through that time slice of this room and goes to the past of that distant experiment and there'll be a space like hypersurface that goes to the future of the experiment um, if I know the um, state on that earlier one I should be able to use that for computing probabilities of the outcome of my experiment but I should also be able to uh, uh, I shouldn't get the wrong answer if I use this, the the the, um, po the the state that, that goes to the goes to the future of that other experiment. So if I if I'm going to use that state, I don't know what the outcome of that experiment is, but I can. So I don't know what that state is, but I can form a mixed state that's a weighted average of them. And so that that that's what this that's that's what this is. So this row bar is um, average of possibilities for a mixed state, which is the average of possibilities for um, um, uh, for 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 the future state on uh, on sigma prime weighted by the probabilities, and um, you might say, well, where do the probabilities go? But if I normalize these things, I'm going to have um, Square norm of these things on the on the bottom, and then that, but that's just the prob the, the the probability. So, yeah, there's a factor of one in there that you can't see. Okay. All right. So, the condition that for local matters here, outcomes of experiment that I'm going to do, I get 
the same probabilities for uh, uh, for for those um, depending on whether you know independently of, of of whether I use the state known state on you know, on sigma or this mixture of states on sigma prime. Necessary for, and sufficient condition for that is that observables per, pertaining to ex experiments done in a space-like region from from delta commute with all of these. Um, uh, commute with all those evolutionary operators associated with delta. Are you with me so far? Just the general general scheme for for formulating some kind of relativistic collapse theory. Um, okay. Okay. So, people, what people did is they took um, CSL. And they basically imported it into a relativistic spacetime. Um, so if mass density, you, you've got the zero. Um, you know, that's not mass isn't a, a relativistic invariant thing, but you've got a stress energy tensor, tensor of which it's a the zero zero component, and all those all those components compute, commute with each other, so you can collapse a near. Um, um, Near eigenstates of a smeared stress energy tensor. Um, now, if I do that, and I have a theory like that, if I just look at the mass density in this room, and I compute it using difference, you know, yeah, you know, in this room at this time, say, you know, at eleven twenty-one, and and there'll be various. Um, Space-like hypersurfaces that are, uh, uh, that of which this time slice of this room is, are a part, and if there's collapses going on between those, then they may differ on the mass density contents of this room. And this is something that's confused people, and, and, and there are arguments in the literature to the extent to the to the effect that. Um, Relativistic collapse theories just can't work because of that weird feature because they might differ from on the contents of the room. Um, that's not the right way to think about it. Because when I talk about the mass density in this room, what I want to, to be talking about is what Bell would call a local beable, something that's a matter of local intrinsic fact about this room. So we do tend to think that the fact that there's a table here and that Chris Meek is sitting there is a fact about this room and is compatible with all kinds of things going on outside the room. Where there are other facts about this room, say that we're, you know, um, you know uh, uh, um, 93 million miles from the nearest star, or something like that, you know, that's a fact about this room, which is a reference to things outside it. So local intrins local beables, local intrinsic facts about the room shouldn't be implicit um, references to things at a distance. And if I take dif different reduced states of the room from various um, um, space-like hypersurfaces, those will depend on collapses that, that happen at a at space-like distance. None of those. And so, and so far as I disagree, none of those are going to, are candidates for local beables. They're not local intrinsic facts about the room. They're implicit references to the things that happened at a distance. So there's a series of papers from the 90s by Girardi and collaborators and Philip Pearl about how to um, make sense of local beables in these theories. And the upshot of that is that what you should do is take, if I want to talk about local beables for this room, you, the hypersurface that you take is the past light cone. So, uh, of, of, you know, th so I take a little time slice of this room. Yeah, there's going to be all kinds of space-like separate space-like hypersurfaces that, that go through it, and as you, it, then if you take a series, you can have a series uh, of, of them that go to the past of each other and converge on the past light cone, and those will converge on a mass density. And that mass density will be depend only on things that happened to the past of right here and now. Those are the local variables. 
Okay. Okay. So, so it looks like we're in good shape for um, coming up with a relativistic um, collapse theory that gives a picture that includes local beables that are mass densities, and that gives us tables and chairs and things like that. And in a survey article that um, Philip Pearl published in 1999, I can't believe I actually read this 20 years ago, um, he presents a simplified version of CSL in a relativistic setting and, and exhibits some nice features that it has. And he says, the good news collapse works well. Then the next paragraph says, the bad news is collapse works too well. Because what this theory that he gives does produces infinite number of particles per unit time from the vacuum. And it wasn't just Pearl who was running into this problem. Other people, Diozzi and, um, and others who are trying to construct relativistic collapse theories are running into this blow up kind of problem too. And Bell actually, in the last um, few months of his life, gave a lecture in Trieste where he's discussing these. He was very interested in this relativistic collapse theory um, uh, uh, pro project. If you're tempted to say that Bell's theorem shows there can be no such a theory, um, in no such theory, then you are in disagreement with Bell on that. And he and he discussed these pro blow up problems and um, said he thought these were what he called what, boring terminology from Dirac type two difficulties, merely technical difficulties. So Dirac would talked about type one difficulties, which were the deep conceptual issues, and type two difficulties, which were technical difficulties. And um, Bell was optimistic that they would that, that they would be. Um, Solved. Okay. And a matter of fact, a number of years later, they were because in 2011, um, Daniel Beddingham did cre create a relativistic collapse theory that works without without this without this um, this problem. Um, though I'm not absolutely sure, given the way it was done, I'm not sure that it was merely solving a, a technical problem and not. Um, addressing a deep conceptual problem, because I'll, I'll talk about this in a moment. So this is actually, so here's the lesson that Pearl draws from this. In a relativistic theory, when any vacuum excitation occurs, it must be infinite excitation. So you're talking about free theories. A particle of a particular form of momentum produced from the vacuum in one frame has a different momentum in another frame. So since all frames are equivalent, all frames must have particles of all momenta come out of the vacuum. Therefore, to make a sensible relativistic theory, all vacuum excitation must be limited. So the way to think about that, if you, in a free theory, if you say, well, look, I'm, suppose I've got a certain probability per unit time of producing particles out of the vacuum. So possible excitations will be indicated, um, indexed by form momentum on the mass shell. Um, so I want, for, want a probability distribution over the mass shell, which is relativistically invariant. There is no bounded measure on the mass shell that is invariant under boosts. Um, it's in, and so that's that I think is what per, what 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 Pearl is 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 saying, and you know, in slightly different language, that's what he's saying, is you have to you, know, you 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 have to have absolutely no particle production from the vacuum, because if you have any at all, and you require the probability measure over which excitations you have, um, there's just no probability measure that, 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 that integrates to one over, that's relativistically invariant over the possibilities. Five minutes? OK. I'm going to have to speed up a bit. All right. OK. All right. OK. So here are the conditions we have for a sensible relativistic collapse theory. One, evolution operators pertaining to a region delta commute with operators representing observables of space like separation from delta. Two, stable vacuum. Can we do it? Well, there's a serious problem with it. 
Okay, so in, in terminology, I'm going to call standard fields, which are basically all the fields you've ever seen um, in any ordinary quantum field theory. You have field operators, which you know we call them field operators, but they're actually operated value distributions, which become oper give you operators when smeared with test functions. Um, and in an ordinary quantum field theory, you have infinitesimal generators of space-time tra tra translations like that, and you assume that they satisfy what's called the spectrum condition, that the, um, if A is a, is a space-like, um, I'm sorry, time-like future directed jet vector, then the spectrum of, you know, of PA is positive. And that basically is just another way of saying is that the energy is going to be positive with respect to any frame. All right, so it's a positive energy condition. OK. For any um, open space time R, we can const cons construct an algebra of, of, of operators which are formed from polynomials in these fields smeared with functions with support in R. This is the usual thing. And I can take the vacuum and operate with all with, with, with um, operators from that and take the norm closure of that. So there'll be a Hilbert space, which is the closure of the set of everything you get from operating on the vacuum with operators in that algebra. And the Riesz-Lieder theorem says that for any open spacetime region, even if it's you know even if it's a bounded region, that Hilbert space is the the um, the, the um, Hilbert space you get from unrestricted operation um, on, on 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 the vacuum. So, okay, all right. So some of you might be seeing where we're going to get. Into. So suppose I've got you have to evolve through a bounded space-time region delta. Um, Stability of the vacuum means that with certainty this takes vacuum to vacuum. Um, I guess notice I've got typos on <laughs> there, but anyways, um, takes vacuum to vacuum. So that means that coming from the vacuum, I don't actually have some kind of stochastic evolution. I've got deterministic evolution. There's only one possibility for that vacuum. And that means that if I take any two of these um, Evolution operators associated with, with gamma, they have to, when operating the vacuum, they have to yield things that are just multiples of each other, all in the same ray. Or another way of saying that is that. So here's where I start to get into trouble. Because now, let me take operators from a region space like separated from, from, from delta. And um, I, um, operate on a state, okay, you know, say A omega. Well, um, um, if these guys commute with that A, then I'm going to have to have, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that equal to zero also. So n n what, no matter what state I take, if I, oper if I get the state by operating on a, um, on, a, on a vector, by operating on the vacuum with, with, with some operator space like separated from delta, I have the same issue. I've got deterministic ev ev evolution. It, it, uh, um, it, there's only one possibility for the future, future of that, that thing. All right. And that's true for everything in the, in the standard Hilbert space. So given the conditions I've put, I have only, the only theories I have are so tri tri trivial special cases of stochastic evolution where there's only one possibility, which is actually deterministic evolution. So when all these k gammas produce multiples of the same vector, I actually have um, deterministic evolution. Okay, so if we have these, those two conditions, 
we get this conclusion. Now, if I'd run across this um, reasoning, say, 10 years ago, I would say, OK, whole project is sunk. This is a no-go theorem for relativistic collapse theories. But um, what has actually happened is that, as, as I said, Bettingham and Pearl has actually con constructed collapse theories that work. Wait, wait, Wayne, haven't you just contradicted yourself? Well, here's what they do. Philip, um, back in 1993, introduced a non-standard field. So that's what my, was the reason for my terminology of standard fields a moment ago. If you haven't looked at these theories, every field you've ever seen is a standard field. This is something which has no intrinsic dynamics. It can take on arbitrary values at any point in, in space, and they're completely independent of each other at any, at, 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 at any two points, even if those points are time-like related. So it commutes with itself at any two distinct points, even time-like related ones. So it does not, it, you know, it, 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 it doesn't have um, the sort of evolution that we, we, we imposed on those, we, we assumed for those standard fields. And then um, what um, Bettingham and then Pearl did is they constructed a theory where, um, yeah, so you, if you've got a vacuum state that's the ground state of all the, of, of, um, of um, all, the, all the fields, including the pointer field, it's completely stable. But they couple, it, it couples the pointer field to the matter fields so that if you've got a state that has some non-trivial matter fields, you, you, you can have stuff going on and it collapses to eigenstates of the pointer fields, but the, the pointer fields drag the matter fields with, with them. And um, you don't, so you, you have these um, conditions met with, uh, um, you have a sta absolutely stable va vacuum. You have the um, the um, uh, um, absolutely stable uh, uh, um, va vacuum. You've got the other conditions met, but because your full Hilbert space isn't the standard Hilbert space, you get some non-trivial um, collapse outside of the vacuum. So that's one option. So I said, or, you know, I'm, all, I'm almost done. So I said earlier, things about no ghost theorem is you can think of them as um, pointers to further research. If you're going to have a theory like this, it has to violate one of the conditions. Um, so um, this is um, these theories introduce these non-standard fields, and they take us out of the standard Hilbert space. Another option, and um, this was suggested to me by um, Daniel Sadarsky and Ely Sokin, is you can give up the idea that we'll have a, a, a theory that will function, function acceptably in, in flat space. Because one of the things, the, the argument that I had to have an absolutely stable vacuum um, depended on having all this symmetry in Mankowski space and that, um, st that state um, respecting, ha you know, having a vacuum state that has all those symmetries. So um, they're imagining, okay, it, it, maybe you've got a theory that blows up in flat space but works okay if you've got enough curvature. And of course, we've always got curvature, so we've always got mass around. I'm not, I don't know how that would work. Um, they have not explicitly constructed the model, but I don't have a knockdown argument that it won't work. And um, one of the things that I um, assumed is that states of on at future times are um, the probabilities of states of future times are determined by um, a state on a on a given hypersurface, and basically the state on a given hypersurface screens off any events to the past of the hypersurface. Anton Tilwah has suggested to me that we might have a collapse theory that, that violates that kind of, um, that, 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 that condition. Again, not clear how it would work, but it's not ruled out by this, this theorem. Okay, so, um, and so in these, two, the, 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 you know, this, this first um, avenue, we've got explicit theories 
but they raise a question of you know, how, how are we supposed to think about these weird pointer fields? Um, these other options are basically at the moment research programs and you know, I basically, as far as I know, have named all the people who are, who are working on them. Okay, thank you. So we started uh, five minutes late for the introductory remarks, so I'll allow five minutes into the lunch period for questions. So um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and keep it raised high until I've acknowledged you. Alan, you can start. Okay. Um, how, does collapse have an effect on entanglement? So if you have, if you have a theory like this where it seems like collapse would be spontaneous, does that mean you should just expect entanglement experiments to start having weird results if, if it's been a long time since the entanglement started, so there's a chance that it will just spontaneously collapse? Okay. So the way these theories work is you've got adjustable parameters like how, you know, you know, of collapse rate and width of the collapse pass. Pa, pa, pa. Yeah. And um, so they're, um, they're worked... They're, they're rigged up so that if, you, if I have, say, a superposition of photon, be, one photon being here or here, that will that can in principle persist many multiples of the of, of, of the of the universe. So we would not be seeing um, effects of this kind of collapse in the Bell type experiments. Yeah, okay. um, what they're meant to do is now, once the, the, the thing gets entangled with macroscopic apparatus, then it tends to collapse. Um, so there are um, various experiments you can do to um, um, test these collapse theories, because the evolution is different from the ordinary unitary evolution. So they do ma make um, different predictions from ordinary evolution, or ordinary um, qu qu um, quantum mechanics. So you would have to, though, if you're if you're testing them directly, you'd have to see, you, you know, imagine, for example, instead of a pair of pol polarized photons polarized entangled, but get a situation where you do an experiment over here, and if the one result moves a bowling ball here or, or or there, and then you have superposition of this bowling ball here and this bowling ball there, etc., and it'll tend to coll to collapse those. But decoherence, you know, will 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 make it very hard to um, actually detect. Um, uh, um, superpositions of these kinds of things. So the, the theories we have are, and another way to test them is um, energy is not conserved. Um, so if you just let something heat sit for a while, it'll be very slowly heating, but um, uh, um, you know, people have looked for evidence of, say, heating of the interstellar medium or things like that, and um, Within experimental error, the the, the proposed um, parameters for these theories are just are, ju are just fine. But so in principle, so there. But this is important. There are um, 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 these theories do yield to 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 um, in principle testable for the predictions, even though um, doing the experiment would be very difficult. Yeah, at the back. Yep, um, a little bit more general of a question. I enjoyed your presentation, um, first of all, very much. The mm -hmm. historical um, notes on the paper were very nice. Um, would you say that special relativity is emergent or fundamental? And likewise, would you say quantum mechanics is emergent or fundamental? Yeah, so um, I usually just take for granted that any theory we actually have is not fundamental. Because, uh -huh. right, and in this case, we have good reason to think that we don't have a fundamental theory because even of our best quantum field theories don't incorporate gravity, we need some kind of quantum gravity, right? So, yeah, so, um, and special relativity itself 
is some kind of a local approximation because we do do we don't think we live in Minkowski space. But this, right? Um, this is why um, Sidarsky and Ocon have some hopes of a theory that formulate a theory that works but doesn't work in Minkowski space. So we do think that special relativity is kind of a local approximation to general relativity, and general relativity itself is probably a approximations to some deeper, more fundamental theory. And um, what, you know, what is that is, you know, magic research. Yes, so, um, so that's a good point because I am assuming, um, uh, so one of the questions is, you know, how robust of this is, is this on uh, 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 the relaxation of idealizations? Like, yeah, um, uh, um, I, you know, I was assuming you've got Minkowski space, you've got a vacuum state which has all the symmetries of Minkowski space. If I take that as a proximate, then um, you know, how robust is this theorem under that? Because, yeah, I, I do think that what this is is a mod of... You know, if these theories were right, they're modifying the um, unitary dynamics of quantum mechanics. That theory itself, so you know, it is it is some kind of low energy approximation to something deeper we don't know what. And so I think it, it is an important point in any kind of discussion of what a theory is telling you about the world. It's important to bear in mind that you should not take that theory to be a fundamental theory. By the way, I don't think that that means you can't actually ever ask what the theory is telling you about the world. You, guess, you have to make sure that your conclusions are robust under um, the transition to a, a, a deeper theory. I, I think the classical mechanics told us an awful lot about what the world is like. Uh, Dave Baker. Um, you got a follow up over there, did you? Oh, oh, sorry. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. No worries. Okay. Um, Go ahead. So, would you say that either of those approaches are then two body or three body? I'm sorry, I don't know what, what, what you're at. Say, okay. say, say, say more. So, it seems, let's see, and I have to be honest too, I am um, not a student. Um, I'm an independent researcher, okay. so the first question I asked for myself, but okay. the second question is on behalf of my mentor, who's not here right okay. now. Um, but I believe, so how, what is your familiarity with the two-body problem? I'm not sure I know what you mean. So, um, like, we can talk about the gravitational two-body problem, which is, um, is that what you're talking about? And then you know, gravitational n-body problem. Um, so no restriction on matter, matter content in these. So I'm not assuming one, two, or n, or you know, you know, the matter content could be anything. So not two-body, not three-body. No assumption that the, that the matter divides up into a finite number of bodies at all. Okay, but for special relativity and quantum mechanics, would you? give that designation to either of those? Neither of those has any, ha, 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 puts, not, not, neither of those is restricted to any finite number of bodies, no. I'll have to clarify. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Dave? Uh, yeah, um, so a uh, couple of things, uh, one really simple and, and one is related. Um, so are the, are the Benning and Pearl theories, do they, no, no. So yeah. So basically, what they do is, um, you know, again, the scheme is take your take your take, take your favorite quantum field theory, with whatever mat, mat, matter fields and things like that you want it, and then in addition to those fields, there are pointer fields, and they couple the pointer fields couple to the matter fields. So yeah, because what you want to get at the end of the day is collapse to near eigenstates of smeared mass density, where the mass is the ordi ordinary matter. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, the other thing is just like, introducing the pointer fields, I mean, does that, that, doesn't, does that do anything weird to the algebra observables, or do you still have normal computation relations with those? I mean, in, in which case, I guess I feel like... Okay, so the pointer observables have abnormal commutation relations. So they, they, they commute with each other at any pairs of points, right? So, um, so, so if, so if you start, um, 
Um, so you've got the, so you got your matter fields, and those obey all the kind of commutation relations that you, that you want them to. The Porter fields commute with all the matter fields, and point, point field at every point commutes with everything. Um, so, um, so then you, you, you've got an algebra, which is you, you can form a pol polynomial of all these fields, matter and pointer fields. But if I've, I've already told you what the commutation relations there are there, because I, you know, I, I, I give you the, co the commutations for the pointer fields and the matter fields, and it, that tells you how to do products and stuff like that. But yeah, so these. Um, the, these pointer fields have, um, I mean, he does define um, momenta conjugate to them. So it has a proper conjugate, commutation relation with, it, with its momentum. But you know, point, pointer fields at different points have um, abnormal commutation relations because they commute with each other even at, at time-like separation. Sebastian. This is very related yeah. to the question about the pointer fields. Yeah. I guess my question is, it looks very weird that they come you in time like yes. separation. Is that, does that have any implication for, say, the properties or the, the normal observables, like the standard quantum mechanical observables? Um, or so it has, if you couple the pointer fields to the matter fields, it has implications for how those matter fields evolve. Um, and you get this collapse evolution rather than the ordinary unitary evolution. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure that answers your question, though. My worry is, would the normal observable still, uh, uh, if they are kind of separated? Yeah. Right, that's right, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, basically you start with your you start with your favorite quantum field theory and all those Heisenberg picture operators obeying the ordinary ordinary um, commutation relations and they all those are all the standard fields. Remember so I remember I had standard fields, right? And and so those 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 will have generators of space-time translation the the way exactly the way you would expect them to. And so you've got all those. So you know, imagine you've got that. And so um, a theory like this, if there were no comp coupling between the, the pointer fields and, and the matter fields, the matter fields would just be evolve exactly the same way they do in ordinary quantum field theory. But then we introduce this, the, 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 this coupling, and it just alters the Evolution of the of the of the matter fields because we've got the, the coupling to these pointer fields which are, are doing weird things. Uh, Mike, so this is so we chatted about this before, but it's been a while, yeah. so I yeah. guess just kind of as a yeah. reminder. Uh, Could you speak up a little bit? I just going to say so I'm chatting about this before, but so my question is kind of a request for a reminder. Okay. About certain. So in this last slide here. I can I can kind of see what like I can kind of see what the motivation might be for the third and fourth option. Yes. But I'm wondering what, if any, is the motivation that Ben and Pearl give for the non-standard fields? Can you, can you yeah, so, yeah, so th that was sort of the genesis of me thinking about this because um, I'm reading these papers and they um, make what what seems to be and totally unmotivated and strange move. And so I asked myself, well, okay, was there any need to do that? And it turns out in the framework they're working, that's the only way to get the to satisfy it's the it's the only way to satisfy the conditions that you've got that you have a absolutely stable vacuum without the but actual collapse starting from states other than the vacuum. It's the only, you know, so given the other assumptions, it's the only way to do it. So they're basically driven to do it. Um, do they offer plausibility arguments that this is physically motivated? No, they don't. So basically, the way to think about, and I'm pretty sure this is um, the way um, Bettingham and Pearl both um, think about this is, um, it's a proof of principle. If someone says it's impossible to have a relativistic collapse theory, the answer is no, it's not impossible. There, we got one. Right. 
Um, it's got, if you're just trying to construct a proof of principle type theory, a toy theory suffices and you can make ad hoc moves that don't have to be physically motivated. Um, I think Pearl's hope is that these pointer fields, the fact that we're driven to um, uh, um, introduce them is a, that this is some kind of um, indication of some kind of deeper level of real, re reality that's there in addition to ordinary matter. And, but we don't really at this point know how to think about it. But that's just sort of a vague kind, kind of thing. So, yeah, so the answer is, um, I think the way to think about this is um, if you look at some of Bell's early papers, he says, could you have a theory that, you know, people would say it's impossible to have a, for example, a deterministic theory that gives the, the, the behavior of a single spin one half particle. No, it's not. And he gives this completely artificial toy model. And the artificial reality is kind of the point because he, what he's saying to you is, well, look, um, the conditions you've given me aren't impossible because I can just, you know, with, without any pretense of physical plausibility, construct a model that satisfies those conditions. Um, so if you're going to say it's impossible, you have to impose further, further conditions. Yes, yeah, so I think, yes, yeah, so that's the sort of thing that just the question being addressed is can we construct a relativistic collapse model that satisfies certain conditions? Yes, we can. Um, it's got this weird feature. Can we do without the fe weird feature? Well, not without violating some of the other parts of the framework. Okay, uh, Ben, what's that? Uh, I think you just answered my question probably. But, so I was going to ask, what, uh, how are we supposed to try to interpret these pointer fields? But I take it you're saying, not yet. Well, that's a good question. If, so the question is, should we take these as just kind of toy models or a pointing towards something we might take seriously? And if we do think of these as pointing to something to take seriously, then there's a serious question. What, how, how should we think of these pointer fields? Uh, one of the reasons they're called pointer fields, it's as if there's an independent experiment being done at every point in space time, like we're always being watched, right? Um, so what, yeah, so if we were to try to take these serious theories seriously, that would raise an interesting question. What, how, how to make sense of these, of these kinds of things? Yeah. So, yeah, that's... So, so one possibility is this is just a totally artificial, ad hoc, um, physically impossible mo pr proof mo model. Another possibility is that the fact that we're introducing these kinds of things is actually telling us something about what a serious theory might look like. I don't know which of those. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, I like the, I'm looking forward to, to tomorrow. I'm going to, the talk is going to be related. So I really hope that you are here tomorrow as well. I'll be here. That's going to be fun. Um, I have several, several questions, I guess, uh, comments. Well, one of them, um, uh, when you say it commutes with itself at any interesting point, even time like related yeah. ones, that in itself is surprisingly magical, but you also mean light like connected ones as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. You see, for example, flat space time 3 plus 1 massless field, time like the amplitude commutes with itself, time like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Also, so, also like, then, yeah. yeah. Um, here's about the third point, right? The third point would be a very strong one for me to, to, to uh, give up, I guess. Uh, the, 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 the theory has to work in incognito space time. And the reason is because. And the reason really is like I can do epsilon perturbation from Minkowski, right? A very small perturbation from Minkowski, and you would expect the experiments done in a lab, right? Would be uh, working very well with that kind of approximation, right? And so, on. so, um, and I, I wonder why, uh, because you see, when you don't not only give up Minkowski, you give up anything uh, that, uh, for example, you give up cosmology models, Freeman Robertson work kind of model, because you have the same kind of time like symmetry, right? I wonder do, the third one you. Do you consider the third one a serious possibility yourself, like your opinion? Um, one of these days, I want to sit down and ask myself what a theory like that might work like. 
look, look like. Um, and after that, ask me that question whether I think it's a serious possibility. So at this point, um, I don't have a clear sense of what even that would be like enough to, to really think of as a serious possibility. Um, I, I, you know, it's there, it's, it's, it's there on the table to think, think about. Um, because I would expect whatever uh, uh, successful, I guess, model to present yeah. any phenomenological even yeah. model yeah. in one could hear about something like that. Yeah. So I would expect that I could approach me formally. I could approach to a limit in which I can get the limit of flat space. Yeah, that, yeah that, so that, yeah, so that's what my reaction. So, um, yeah, you know, basically these these options are are, are here because when I, when I put my paper up on the on on the ar ar archive, Antoine emailed me and said, yeah, right. And then I've um, talked about these things with Daniel. Um, so yeah, so so my well, my response to um, Daniel is about this is well, look, you know, when we're doing actual tests of quantum field theory, um, we, we totally ignore the fact, we totally ignore any curvature. Like, so, you know, scattering experiments are, happen in s small regions of space, space and time, and sure, even if we know we're not living in Minkowski space time, that patch of it is, is, is approximately flat. And they say, well, yeah, but there's always, you know, even there's the particles are there, and they induce curvature of space time. And I'm going, hold it, wait. Those tiny little, you know, you want, a, you want a theory that works okay as long as you have those tiny little curvature due to having little particles around, but doesn't, but, but blows up when, because I would expect a, a, a theory, to, it, it, you know, it ought to, even if it's in curved space time, you know, it ought to behave nicely in a, in, in a limit as you pro, approach flat space. And, they don't have a concrete model, but they're imagining one that works okay as long as you've got local inhomogeneities of curvature and would blow up as your approach flatness. Can there be a theory like that? I myself am not trying to construct a theory. If they want to try to construct a theory and if they send it to me, I'll look at it. Okay, time for one final question here. Right. So in the, in the non-relativistic context, I mean, this is, I think you, you more or less mentioned that GRW proposed this more or less as a toy model. Right, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's just, I mean, the, the Gaussian is just assumed yeah. and the many, many things yeah. are just fitted to be um, mm -hmm. compatible with, 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 uh, right. with experiments. Just so, and then you, you spoke about the additional challenges that we use in the relativistic yeah. context. Are that, do you also see any hints when you go to a relativistic context, how you call it might how things might improve, right? How you might how those the, that, that freedom of, of choosing the parameter to fit it to the facts might be might be might be constrained to the relativistic setting. Does it just get worse? So um, so the move from, from say GRW to CSL seems to me, me very well motivated. Right? Um, so there, there's there's something much more natural feeling about about, about the CSL than the GRW, and um, then move to a relativistic setting. It puts more constraints. In fact, it puts too many constraints because the sort of theory you would expect to construct actually turns out to be impossible. Okay. Okay, with that, um, please join me in thanking Wayne once again. <laughs>